I'm a fundamental believer that failure is a better teacher than success. I think it helps guide you and understand better than because success teaches you things, but it doesn't help you overcome challenges that you're facing and failure does. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I am super, super excited to have the founder and CEO of PIX, Paul Mabry. I'm not going to pronounce your name right, am I? That's all right, Paul Mabry. It works great. You can pronounce it any way you want. Awesome. Okay. So, great to see you. Great to see you, too. So PIX is the world's first wine discovery platform with a simple matchmaking mission which is to pair people with bottles that bring them joy. I loved that when I was reading your mission. I loved it. It was so great. So uh, Paul is a serial entrepreneur. We'll let him talk a little bit more about some of his other ventures, but he has just been this amazing change maker uh, in the wine industry. He lives up in Napa, not too far from where I am. He's been up there for 20 years. He had actually asked me to come and speak at one of his um, summits, and that's how we got to meet. So I'm so, so thrilled to have you here and just to hear a little bit more about your story. So welcome, Paul. Thank you, Kara. It's great to be here. And uh, you've been a hero of not just mine, but the wine industry for a long time, because I've been shouting you from the top of the rooftops, as you know, before you came to the summit. So I good love to be here it. with you. Yeah. I love it. So let's talk about the beginning. I love talking about this because I often don't even know this about people. I don't know sort of about you. Like, who was young Paul? Like, did you always know that you were going to be a serial entrepreneur or and live in Napa and all that? No, no. Actually, I grew up in Napa. I wanted to get out of here as fast as possible. So I went away to film school. I wanted to be a director and a writer. Um, but I got a job as a salesman uh, for a guy named John Wright, who founded Domain Chandon. And I am the worst, worst, worst sales guy you've ever met in your life. But I'm a bit of a nerd. So I programmed my own little CRM program uh, that would tell me who to call when. And uh, my sales hockey stick, it looked like I was a hero. Um, but it was just me paying attention to the accounts, um, you know, over and over. And that kind of set my career in a different direction. So while all my friends were bus boys and waiters in the film industry. I had a $2,000 expense account. I had free you know, booze. I had lots of dinners and I was making really good money. I'm like, I think I'm going to take a career shift. This is really cool. Um, and then quickly, uh, I, I fell into the bucket of hubris thinking that I was going to be one of the big change agents of the wine industry and I wanted to be the next Robert Mondavi, but using digital. Um, now it's a very different story. So interesting. So you started out in sales and marketing and then like, how did you get into direct to consumer then? It was actually my second job. I found out that I wasn't going to be CEO by the time I was 23, <laughs> which I shouldn't have been, by the way, that would have been terrible title inflation. And I went to work for Nibom Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola's winery. And I report directly to the CEO and I was the skunk works guy. My job was to do all kinds of wackiness that the CEO decided, everything from their food line to their ERP to... Um, compliance. It was this great cross training. Um, and then he gave me a project. Um, you know, he said, I'd like you to start our first wine club. And back then, that was really a subscription business now, essentially, right? Like Hint does. Um, and uh, back then, the wine club and the subscription business, you were the Quasimodo. It was the worst job to actually have. I, was, I remember crying to the CEO saying, I, please don't make me do this. Um, and he did still. Um, and we became an incredibly successful um, wine club. It was the most successful, I think, from like zero to 3,000 wine club members in six months. We what did year like was our, this? It was like 95. It was way back oh when. Oh, my it God. Was like, Crazy. And so we did um, – uh, or 96. And uh, what was interesting about that wine club is it was more like plated than it was like a wine club. We had the pasta from Francis Ford Coppola. We had a movie. We had a recipe, American Zotrope, and the wine. And so you get this package every month, almost like plated – and it was like Francis, eat like, drink like, be like Francis in a box. So pretty interesting. So talk about how the journey in the wine space has changed from the beginning until now. I mean, I I think, you know, obviously you're a wine e-commerce pioneer, uh, being <laughs> back in, in the same time that I was starting all this e-commerce stuff. So talk to us about some of the challenges that you had to overcome. I mean, there's there's lots of regulations that have changed 
over the years. Some still haven't changed, but can you share a little bit more about that for those who are not familiar with some of the hurdles you have to hop over? Yeah. So wine was probably the last industry to adopt the internet. And and I, I say probably was, I'm pretty sure it was, and it only happened in, during COVID, but a lot of it was tied to regulatory barriers and also the apathy because we were growing so fast. I mean, the wine industry has been successful for 20 years straight, double digit growth, both volume and then uh, price point. Um, so Napa, as a, as a small example, the Eno tourism here is amazing. I mean, you come here, it's just getting more and more busy in Sonoma, Napa, Santa Barbara. Um, so we've been very fortunate as an industry. So when you don't have to change, if it's not broken, why fix it? Um, so that's been kind of one of the great hindrances. But then the regulatory stuff has been brutal. You know, back when e-commerce first came out with virtual vineyards and wine.com and wine shop are kind of the three first things. There were state regulations that shifted and adjusted and how much wine you could get where it became so convoluted and so terrible um, that it was almost impossible to ship wine. And then in 2005, wineries got permission because of a Supreme Court case called the Granholm decision. And now wineries can ship pretty much to any state, but retailers can't. And still going through this, you know, regulatory changes. But COVID's unlocked that. I think you're going to see an acceleration. I think you're going to see more companies selling wine in different ways. It's like the genie's out of the bottle. And the the speed by which we're going in the internet is just unbelievable. And many people don't understand that the business of alcoholic beverages, it really still depends on like what type of alcohol, right? That there's mm -hmm. hard alcohol. So how is that different from beer versus wine? Yeah. So wine's been kind of at the forefront of shipping. It's a kind of nice price point. It's just considered like much more of a social beverage than it is that kind of um, pre-prohibition abusive beverage. You know, that's where spirits kind of fall into. I think those other uh, industries that are adjacent to wine have been slower to kind of break down the regulations on the on the beer side. The cost per shipping was pretty expensive. It's a heavy product like water. Um, so, you know, unlike water, though, you have to have an adult signature. You know, you have to have all these other layers and barriers to get it there. Um, so that made it much more challenging. So the cost, the ROI in doing beer was pretty low. Spirits has been pretty high, but it's such a competitive market for shelf space. And it's not a very long tail product. I mean, you go into the vodka section, there's what, 20, 30 vodkas. You go into wine, there's 200 different wines just in a supermarket. And one, you know, in the United States every year, I think we release 160, 180,000 new wines and they stay good in the market to, you know, to 10 to 20 years. So Right now for sale, there's probably 2.5 million different wines for sale in the United States right now. Everything from a really old port to like, you know, Sutter Home White's Infidel. Amazing. Um, so how have you seen the fires, the weather changes? I mean, you're living up in Napa, obviously had lived through many of those pretty scary uh, times yeah. over the last few years. But has how has that changed the wine industry overall so the wine industry is probably the most in touch with the earth in a lot of ways at the same time we have an original sin um so we we feel fires and earthquakes we feel climate change we're right there we see it in the vineyards we see it in our water tables you know all the different things that people so we're very tied into that land and we're actually very conscious about climate change uh you know the torres family the gallows they really lean into solar they try to find ways to um, reduce bottle weight. Um, but we also, at the same time, we wrestle with which is wine industry's original sin. For us to taste wine from Australia or from Spain, we have to put that juice in some sort of container and drive it across the world and right. ship it across the world. Whatever way we do, and not only do we ship it across the world, we ship it multiple times in multiple places across the world. So that will always be our sin. It's the only way that we can actually enjoy those products from different places and times. It's something that we're facing all the time, looking at how we offset that. How do we make balance with the world? So technology has been something that you've gravitated towards over yeah. the years, as you mentioned, and you spotted opportunities early around you. How can technology really change? What haven't we done yet? I mean, we're talking about Web3, we're talking about NFTs, we're talking about any of that kind of stuff. I mean, what changes are we going to see? You know, we're always on this rat race, changing the next, chasing the next kind of 
arc, right? <laughs> you know, uh, an NFT is being an example or cryptocurrency or Web 3.0. Look, there's so much to unlock with Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and some industries are farther behind than others. So I think COVID, as terrible as a situation as it was for all of us, was kind of an acceleration to adopt these tools to make us sustainable. And we know that digital tools let us talk to people in Boston or in Austin real time. It lets a one human scale times 10. It lets us do better customer service. Uh, you know better than anyone how you can manage these tools to do automated sales and customer care. And then you can keep raising the high level parts, which is the human experience. And I'm actually really a humanist that believes that technology is a tool to enable better humanism, right? You know, that we can have like you and I talking right now, we're using digital tools at scale. It's pretty amazing, you know, having a video conference and being able to record it. That's that's part of the journey and, and how we can have better conversations before and after and how I can text and more inner engaging texts. They're all part of it. So I think that what we're going to see is, is not really about the next wave. It's how do we unlock the waves that we have? I think we're still maximizing those for a long time. And these, these new flashy lures are interesting. Um, but as you know, many of them fade out or are actually really inefficient tools. I mean, cryptocurrency is a key example. Why would I pay you a dollar in Bitcoin today that could either be worth 50 cents tomorrow or $5 tomorrow? It's a terrible currency, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense to have that much volatility in it. So interesting. So let's talk about your company, PIX. Very, very excited. So what made you decide that the world needed PIX? I mean, what was kind of this, when you had the idea, how did you think about it? What was sort of the first steps. So I've been selling tools to wineries my whole time. So I be, I'm this nerd, like I said, and then I went into the 2000s actually starting companies. So I started the first e-commerce SaaS company for the wine industry called Wine Direct. So if you bought wine online from a winery, it was probably Wine Direct that did it. And then I did a big social media listening company called Vintank that I sold and it was the gigantic stuff. I kept selling these tools to wineries saying, here's a shovel, go dig, or here's a fishing pole, go fish. Um, and I was realizing that that wasn't going to do the job. And then when COVID hit, actually, I'd stand on stage and you know that even the summit that we did was trying to teach the wineries to think differently. And as much as I believed in the internet, I actually didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime, Kara. I really was like, even though I knew to my mitochondria that this was the right thing to do, I didn't actually think I would see the changes happen. And when COVID happened, I said, well, the best thing I can do for the industry, and this is where my hubris has changed from trying to be the change agent to my neighbors and friends are going to continue to struggle. The wine industry is becoming more and more challenging. It's competing against more and more things, whether that's climate change, whether that's oversaturation, but also adjacent categories, you know, hard seltzers, hard kombucha, the stomach share for spirits and beer. I mean, it's a it's a very different drinking atmosphere than it was a decade ago. We're omni drinkers. And these beautiful little boutique wineries, finding them on the internet is, you know, a needle in a haystack. So my best job is to aggregate as many consumers as I can and help guide them in this discovery journal. And so that's what we've done. We launched on January 12th. We are the second largest, fastest growing wine selection in the world. Day one, it's been really exciting. So we have a quarter million wines, 5 million offers across 5,000 different wine sellers day one. And, and we're growing every day by five to 10. And it's a really fun journey. It's really magical. We're finding all kinds of interesting parts of the story. So you're not taking inventory or anything. So You're I, I'm even more, I'm not even getting in the middle of the transaction. I fundamentally believe that marketplaces eat markets, hmm. right? So all of these marketplace things that do that and then become the, the, the owner of the traffic. My job is to send the traffic to the retailer of the winery. I'm much more Google-esque mm -hmm. or, or kayak, the original kayak than I am a cart. Um, and, and the good news about that is that's the way we sell wine. You know, we have different States. Maybe I'm in Seattle. Maybe I'm down by your house in Mill Valley. I'm like, I need to get a bottle of wine. For you tonight, I don't know the retail stores. I don't know. Or maybe I'm looking at a wall of wine and I'm not sure which one to pick. And I'm in the wine industry, even masters of wine. There's so many wines and so many places and so many changes. My job is to help navigate that. And so what is the business model for you then? Yeah. So just like Google, we follow a keyword bidding model, right? So the, most of the sites are free. And then if you want to bid your way up to be adjacent to the products or the selection sets that you have, you buy that in. So I deliver pure high fidelity customers to wineries and retailers. Awesome. And how many people do you have now? 24. Yeah. 24. Wow. So yeah. God, that's amazing. That's, that's, amazing. that's wow. That's so, so great. Cause I remember when you were just getting started, I mean, yeah. you're, so what's the hardest thing 
about this. You've done, this is your third yeah. um, startup. And uh, what, what's been the hardest thing about this one in particular? So I think two pieces about it that have been really hard. Um, one of them is tamping down expectations because we have such an all-star team and I've done so many startups before that they expect me to be like Google out of the gate. And as you know, Google has thousands of engineers and totally i mean we're 24 people doing the best we can you know it's it, that sounds like a lot of people but it's when you're lifting up that much inventory um the other one is you know making sure people understand how special we are compared to the startups and failures that have happened in wine tech prior to us that by taking this experienced team that's why we've gone so fast that's why we're winning the hearts and minds of all these wineries and retailers and partners all across the world it's because we're doing it differently and smartly that's awesome. I read an article Thanks. that you said that you're currently or were currently in the golden digital age of wine. So what what does that yeah. mean? Yeah. So golden age is always that new era where things are happening special and it's unlocking all this um, innovation and changes. And so wine has been completely hampered and hindered prior to COVID. It has been the wineries didn't adopt it, retailers, the consumer was always there wanting to buy, but no one was really facilitating that. And then COVID happened. Um, and what happened is all the consumers, as you know, we were ho hoarding toilet paper. We were buying everything online for a while. We were all quarantining, trying to figure out those things. Suddenly now every winery has to sell. And, uh, you know, the acceleration of both all of these different factors, more people buying wine online, learning how to make it easier, more retailers learning how to do it, is getting it better and better. And I've never seen so much acceleration and evolution. And it's going to be so fun to buy wine soon. You know, it's getting easier. In fact, even the things that we're doing. Um, so, for example, we do these things called collections where we make small bite-sized pieces of a giant wine. And we make fun ones. Wines with dogs on the label. You know, wines with female owners. Wines with female owners under 50 cases. Because it's our job to make this big category small and easy. And that's an, it's, it seems like a small thing. But that kind of innovation is not being done by any retailer. But because we're this macro wine selection, we can do insane fun things with this virtual inventory to help customers find what they want. How are you getting the word out about picks? There's so many different factors in that. But really right now that we got so much organic traffic that we're really leaning into mm -hmm. because we're really kind of the AB positive of platforms. You know, there's no other platform that really exists like us that helps the consumer find where to buy the wine they're looking for, how to buy it and other wines to buy. Right. So we have such a wide selection. No one has a wide selection like us, except for another small search engine. Um, so we're getting traffic from partnerships like Robert Parker. Bloggers point to us, you know, all these great publications who when they rate a wine, they say, look, I just gave it 95 points. Let them help you find where to buy it. And that's our job. Right. Um, uh, obviously, we were doing really well in the press. We've already gotten really high accolades from things. We won the Wall Street Journal for our content. And we have a pretty good content engine as well that writes really fun articles. That's awesome. I was actually interviewing, do you know, uh, Minted, Miriam? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was interviewing her yesterday. We were talking about Web3 and mm -hmm. it was really interesting what she was talking about how kind of along the lines of what you're saying too about these search engines and, you know, who, like, it's just much more specialized and unique. And when people are focused on something, it's, I mean, to find what, consumers are looking for that they would find on picks is is just not what you're going to find on Google unless there're multiple strokes and Google's going to make a lot of money off of those and anyway sure. I think it's it's really fascinating um yeah. you guys should connect actually and I, figure out yeah. on sort of um because I think a lot of stuff that she's thinking about it ultimately intersects so she had yeah. actually started a long time ago even I knew her back in the 90s she had started a beauty company called Eve Oh, and, I remember um, that. Yeah. And kind of the, along the same lines as you, like to bring small, uh, you know, unknown. Um, I mean, this is before Sephora. Um, right. You know, bringing sort of unknown brands into the world. And she sold the company, uh, you know, early on. But anyway, it was a lot of what she's talking about, I think, Totally different industry, obviously, but sure. is, is a lot of what you're talking about too. So yeah, so. the abstractions are the same. I mean, um, look, our job is bow to box to protrude and everything in between, right? So, but your your point is well taken. If I look up Chardonnay on Google, which is the most amazing tool in the world, it's a pretty magical tool, but it doesn't understand subject matter expertise. No. 
So no. if I look up Chardonnay, I'm going to get Chardonnay the Grape, Chardonnay the Color, Chardonnay for Sale, and Chardonnay in the Marvin Gaye song. You know, it's all of those yeah. things will come up in the search results. Um, so from, interesting. Yeah. So for us, it's distill it down, help the buyer get the path. That's why Open Table works so well, right? Google has a great restaurant tool as well, but Open Table, because it specializes and it focuses, can do better results than Google can. So, so true. No, it's a great example, actually. I think thinking about open table versus picks, I mean, it, it really is um, a great way to describe it. So for sure. So definitely the organic traffic, but then do you think you guys will be advertising? Do you think you'll be doing a mostly PR word of mouth? I mean, how do you get people to to really know that you guys are out there and sort of yeah, yeah, we'll definitely do a ton of PR, a ton of word of mouth. Obviously, the SEO game is always part of the engine. The content game is part of the engine. Um, and, you know, as long as I can, I want to keep our customer acquisition costs as low as possible because that allows us to. Goal. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so focusing on ad based buying is not really the the key. I mean, I, I we have a really good engine for absorbing and helping traffic get to where it needs to be. And because we're providing so much of it for free. We want to continue to suppress that customer acquisition cost as much as possible. So, but we're also, like I said, we're this great AB positive. Um, and I use that kind of blood analogy, which is, you know, even our big partners. So Treasury is one of our biggest partners. Um, the wine group is a big partner. Wenty, these big companies that don't want to sell direct to consumer, but want to help their customers find, let's call it Martha Stewart's new 19 crimes wine. We're that ultimate vehicle that they can send the traffic and we will point them to the right direction because we're not in the middle of the transaction. Our job is to it. stimulate the market and help them help the customer get to what they need. So great. So you don't think you'll be opening up a winery anytime soon. So it's, no, that, no, that's I'm, not, I don't know. No. It'd, be, it'd be kind of fun that we could taste all the different wines. And so I get it. We'll I'm do just, some big events probably, but we'll organize what we want to do. But opening a winery is not in my, I, we have one woman in the family that does that. As you know, my wife runs yes. Donham. So I stay out of that. <laughs> and Donham is like my favorite, which you turned me on to it. So it's such good. a, so, so good. So, so share a story about a challenge or a failure that you've had along the way. It could be with picks, although it's pretty new, but you, you never know. There could have been some pieces, especially during the last couple of crazy years. And what did you learn from those experiences or that experience? I'm a fundamental believer that failure is a better teacher than success. Um, I think it helps guide you and understand better than because success kind of breeds a, it teaches you things, but it doesn't help you overcome challenges that you're facing as, and failure does. Um, this company, um, I've been fortunate, I've had a lot of failure on my way here, as well as some a few successes. Um, and bringing it together, I knew how to bring together a wine culture, a business culture, and a technology culture, but I didn't know how to bring an editorial culture. And, you know, and so mapping these together. And then this thing is bigger than anything I've ever built at a speed that I've never built. And so oftentimes in the entrepreneurial spirit, people get caught up in trying to over engineer a solution, trying to over build it. And so we came up with these really kind of quick, witty things that we've kind of incorporated. So, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Good is the engine of better. Right. And fast gets good better than good gets fast. Those are kind of two mantras we use. And one of the ways that we've done that is. When we were first starting to design the site, I mean, 250,000 wines is an impossible goal, right? To say, I'm going to fill them out. If I charge, if I say I pay someone $5 per wine, it's a lot of money in the garbage can because next year I have another 160 and I'm going backwards in time. So we created this framework uh, because everyone was struggling with it. It was, uh, we were failing at getting out of the gate. Everyone was like, I need to hire 50 editors. I need to fire 100 writers. I'm like, guys, you're going to burn through all of our capital before we <laughs> we get out of the door. And so I said, look, let's learn. And this learning structure is let's do it 10 times ourselves. Let's do 100 times between, you know, between different groups. And then we'll do it 500 times. And each of those checkpoints, we see where's our thesis falling down on its structure? Where are we failing or what can we do and can't do? So in the product example that I just gave you, you know, we filled it out 10 times and we're like, OK, it takes about 10 minutes to fill out these products. It's going to cost us X. And then we had 100 people do or, you know, 20 of our or 10 of our employees do 100 to do 10 each. And we found that wineries content was crazy. They were writing about their wines in first person. If we were cutting and pasting that onto our site, it looked like Pix was saying, oh, we designed this wine. We made this wine in 1927 from this vineyard. So we were learning all along these ways. This is kind of like a fail forward framework that it does. Um, and 
it was a tough struggle. I have to tell you, the editorial team was really struggling with this whole piece and they were um, really upset that we we're going to have all this content that had grammatical errors. It was in first person versus third person. And I went home and I was just very fatigued and tired because there was a lot of dynamic disagreement going on. And the next morning when I was taking a shower and this is how it became a success, I remembered the story about um, the uh, Microsoft Windows used to have the bug and it said Microsoft Windows has had a critical error. And some guy in customer service changed that message. And I'll have to dig it up in the archives and said, your program has caused Microsoft to have a critical error. So they took the onus of the problem and their customer service calls went down like 90% or some ridiculous stata. So what I did is at the beginning of every product, instead of it being from us, I said, from the producer. <laughs> and so it was a, suddenly everyone was happy. The editorial team was happy. We, we didn't have to cut and paste it. We didn't have to edit it. We, we got to go get it from the wineries and it could be as garbagey as it, they wanted to be, you know, or good as, as good as they wanted it, right? That was a learning how to fail forward and learning how to bring another culture who wanted to make it perfect. That's the editorial team wants to make it look like a magazine. And we wanted to make it look like this clay that iterates over and over again. So this is how we, this is how we got through that. Super interesting. Well, it'll be interesting too, to see kind of as you iterate, because it's like, you know, you probably have to have everybody on the same kind of, they have to have a certain style, right? Uh, it, for mm -hmm. it to kind of blend. I mean, they all have to have their their own style, but they have to they have to keep up with it, right? Too. So I think that that will be key in order to be a part of what you guys are doing. And as you guys grow, I think that it will um, become more and more important for people to to do what is right for their. Um, and I guess I feel like so many of the wineries that are out there now, I mean, it's so different than even it was 20 years ago. I mean, For they sure. didn't have the story, right? They didn't have a lot of the editorial. I mean, right. are you finding like most of them kind of are, are able to keep up with what you need them to do? So because of where we came from, we're able to help them go faster than we yeah. would have done before. So we know the back door into places where we can help them and make it the, as painless as possible. That's our job is to try to make it as easy, remove friction from the system, and then reward them based upon the effort that they actually do. So that's awesome. That's that's where like uh, if you look at Google, they reward people based upon a better site, responsive, mobile friendly. <laughs> We're the same thing. Give us better content. Give us more content. Give us better integrations. Right. Very, very cool. So last question, where are you guys going to be in six months from now? So PIX will be the world's largest wine selection in six months. No question. At the pace we're going, we're adding five wineries and retailers a day, uh, 10,000 products a day. It's going crazy. And then we'll be international. We'll be in the UK uh, probably by the end of this quarter, the very beginning of the next quarter. And we'll launch hopefully our mobile app by the end of six months so that we can follow you around in your pocket and say, let me help you wherever you're trying to find help. If you're at the shelf in front of wine or if you're in a restaurant or and the eventual goal is you walk into a place and we say, by the way, we know you're shopping for wine today. You're in a wine retailer. Here's five wines you're just going to love. So great. Well, super, super thrilled to hear all about your story and, and picks. And it's so interesting and such a great time to be doing this too. So definitely, definitely can't wait to watch the future and see exactly where you guys go with this. But I agree. I think the next six months, it's going to be really fun to check back in with you for sure. So how can the audience stay connected with you and PIX? Yeah. So we're uh, at PIX Wine on Twitter and Instagram everywhere. PIX is the name. And I'm at P Mabry, P-M-A-B-R-A-Y everywhere. You know, it's kind of been my social handle for a long, long time. But I'm looking forward to sharing a glass of wine with you at each of these milestones, Kara, yeah, and some I, champagne too. We'll pop some good stuff. Super yeah. great. And Paul and I are our buddies on Twitter. If anybody wants to pop with us on, on Twitter, yeah. definitely we have some good conversations with each other and other people <laughs> on there. So really, really fun. So thank yeah. you again for coming on. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode. Please subscribe to the Kara Golden Show so that you are sure not to yes. miss amazing stories uh, like Paul's and, and Picks. And please be sure to send in those five-star reviews too. They make such a difference on the algorithm. Our 
podcast has grown significantly. We are showing up on some number one slots in different parts of the world, especially over the last few months in entrepreneurship. So it's very, very exciting to watch that. And please uh, don't forget to follow me on Kara Golden. Uh, Also pick up a copy if you haven't read my book, Undaunted, or listen to it on Audible. I hope you will do that as well. And we are here every Monday and Wednesday. And thank you, everyone. And have a great week. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.